Go to 1 John, if you would, please. We call them Little John. The Little Johns, because they're smaller in size than Big John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John is the apostle who was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos in his final days. It was known that John actually was boiled uh, in a cauldron for his faith. But while he was there, he, he wrote letters and he got Revela he wrote the book of Revelation. And so the Apostle John is dear to us. He was allowed the Holy Spirit to uh, uh, inspire him to write and put words in him to write these books to us. And he's known, 1 John is known as the, the love book. It's the love book. And you'll see the love of God highlighted as we move along. Maybe not the first chapter so much as the, the rest of it. Um, but let's go ahead and just jump into it. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. John says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Notice how he speaks of Jesus. He's speaking of Jesus. We know this because over in his big book, he said that uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Remember that? And then it says, We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. But here he refers to, to that, and he says, We've looked upon, and our hands have handled the Word of life. He made note that it was important for humans, God's people, to handle the Messiah. To handle the Word, the incarnate Word. The Word in flesh. God's Word in a person. He got to handle that. Remember Jesus said that. You know, it was this whole idea of, don't touch me, I haven't ascended to my Father, now touch me. Stick your fingers here, touch me, make sure it's me. It was important that His disciples got... Uh, first-hand touch with Him. He had to come in the earth as a real person. So I think that's why John made note of that. Verse 2, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you. Notice he keeps saying this. We've seen and heard this. We've handled this. That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This is where the message of Jesus Christ brings you to the same place as if you had handled Him yourself. Okay? Me describing something very intimate and detailed to you almost brings you there, doesn't it? And that's what this gospel does. It allows us to uh, get in the same position and have fellowship with the apostles. I mean, I feel a kindred heart to Paul and Peter and John and the other writers, don't you? Once you meet Jesus, you feel a he puts the same spirit, and so you have this kindred heart. And that's all he's saying. We want to have fellowship with each other, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Verse 4, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Notice scripture is supposed to make your joy full. That's right. Is it, does it? Yeah. Does scripture make your joy full? Yeah. Yeah. These things are written to make your joy full. Some people aren't happy unless XYZ is going on. Mm -hmm. What about the scripture making your joy full? Mm -hmm. If you're not there and the scripture doesn't make your joy full, I just want you to know it's supposed to and it can for you. And if you're somebody who has never really committed to Christ and entered into the kingdom looking for answers, looking for truth, looking for God's Word, if you're not one like that, you can be. And when you get there, it'll change your life. Because the Word can make you joy full. Verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. God is light. 
Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Think of how many people would be that. They say they know God, but if they're walking in darkness, they're lying. Because God's not in the darkness. If He were to go in the darkness, there'd be light there. And it wouldn't be darkness anymore. That's right. But if we walk in the... Remember, remember over in John chapter 3 what the scripture said? John chapter 3, he said, uh, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Remember that? And then it says, But he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For he that's in, in the world is condemned already because he loved darkness rather than light, because his deeds were evil. That no one who's in darkness wants to come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. So this idea of sinners not wanting to come to Christ, there's a reason for that. It's not just because I hate religion. It's because they don't want their deeds to be exposed in the spirit realm, in their conscience. They don't want to have to deal with what's really right. And so they avoid it and that's why. That's why. That's why sinners won't get saved. That's why backsliders won't come back. They're enjoying their darkness. They're enjoying what they're doing. and They don't want it exposed or dealt with. Very simple. Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Let's deal with that part first. If we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. So if you're walking in the light, guess what? you're going to have Christian friends. If you're walking in the light, you're going to have Christian friends who fellowship around Christ. If you're walking in the light, you'll be part of a church group. I'm sure there's a few that aren't yet in a church group, but they should be desirous of one. If you walk in the light, you'll, be, you'll want to be having fellowship with each other. If you're not walking in the light, that's when we don't see people. In church. Make sense? Yes. I didn't go to church when I was in darkness. And if I did go to church, I mean, I went a couple times, but when I did, there was no connection anywhere. It was, how, how long is this going to like? When can yeah. I go? Yeah. That's how it is. If you're in darkness, you don't have fellowship with it. And that's one way to tell. That's one way to judge yourself and know who you are, where you're at. That's right. You'll find it if you ever slid away, you would notice. I dare to say you would notice that, you know, you don't have a, an attraction to Christians anymore. Even if you did attend a church, you wouldn't have an attraction. It'd be like, it's, it, why? Because you're not walking in light. But when you walk in the light, you have an affection toward one another. Jesus said, you'd know my disciples by the love they have for one another. That's all he's saying. So, number one, if you walk in the light, you'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Let me, let me pause and back up. I want to say another thing about walking in light and having fellowship with one another. This is how you can pick your friends. This is how Christians can pick their friends. When you have a heart-to-heart, -heart, spirit to spirit connection, you'll know it. When you seem to have this fellowship with people, that's who you want to cultivate the relationship with. There's other people who are not really fully in the light yet. And if you're in the, if you're in the light, then you want to recognize, for some reason, I'm not, I'm not able to fellowship with them. There's just not this thing. Avoid them. I mean, be nice to them and love them and maybe encourage them to come in fully, but recognize that's not who you want to be spending most of your time with. There's no spark there. Those that are in the light, you'll find a spark with. Isn't that exciting? Mm -hmm. And that's really just letting the Spirit guide you and lead you. And you'll know in your heart. Don't get confused in your mind thinking, oh, it'd be, it wouldn't be nice if I didn't. they invited me to the thing. It wouldn't be nice. Don't go there. Don't go there. Just follow your spirit, man. And this is how you can choose your friends and make right phone calls and all these things is knowing in the Spirit, right. you know, how, how, free that, how free that is between you two. What kind of fellowship is there? And if you walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Interesting, isn't it? If you walk in the light, then the blood cleanses us from all sin. This is how you stay clean, walk in the light. And the blood is so easily accessible. 
But if you're going to walk in darkness, then the darkness and the blood are competing all the time. If you're just going to continue there, then what's going to happen? You're not going to feel clean by the blood of Jesus. You're going to break fellowship with people and with God. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So here he's saying walk in the light and don't sin basically. Then it says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So this book of the Bible is written to Christians, isn't it? So far doesn't it feel like it's written to Christians? Sure, sure. But then it goes on to say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. What's he saying there? That we're supposed to go around thinking what a sinner I am? No, I don't think so. But he is trying to help you realize uh, that sin is, is ever there. And if you say you don't have any to deal with ever, then you're deceived. Make sense? Amen. No matter how good you feel you've been, you know, there's just, there's an aspect of always understanding that the blood of Jesus is absolutely essential because everybody slips. Everybody has done something and will do more. <clears throat> Not on purpose, we're going to get to that, but just realize that he's trying to prove that everybody has sin. Uh, it's, it's noteworthy to realize that we don't consider ourselves sinners anymore, though. Some people take this and say, see, we're all just sinners. But we have to graduate from that way of thinking. We're, we're sinners, but we're now saved. So we were sinners, now we're saved, and, and now, the, now, now God calls us saints. Those who believe in Jesus are called saints. In the Bible, those who believe in Jesus are called saints. Sainthood is not reserved just for some of the bishops and cardinals and popes, right? Right. Saints not just reserved for Paul and Peter and John, okay, or Thomas or the other. Saints is what Christians are called. Amen. Yeah, amen. So either you're a sinner or a saint. Mm -hmm. Now even saints can have some sin, right? <coughs> right? We know Paul sinned, we know Peter sinned, we know John sinned, we know everybody sinned. So even though they've sinned, we still call them saints. And really, let's broaden it. Every Christian we call saint if you've received Jesus. Yes. Living up to it's a different story. But the way, you can, the way you perceive yourself is very important. If you just look at yourself as an old sinner, uh, it's, it's on a lower level, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm just an old sinner. No, God's actually glorified you, right. and you're working out some stuff, and we're going to show you how to deal with sin and, and overcome everything. At the same time, see yourself uh, at the victory line rather than I'm never going to make it. Right. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. Uh, notice the word confess there. Uh, confess just means to concede or admit, not deny. That's what he's saying here. Admit to God. Admit it. it you have to get to the truth of the matter. Let's admit things. Uh, if you will admit it, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice how important this is. 1 John 1, 9 is an extremely important scripture. Matter of fact, some people say that when you first get saved, you ought to read the book of John. Uh, but actually, you probably ought to read the book of 1 John. Because 1 John goes through these essential first steps for a believer. So many believers have gotten saved and then fallen the next day. They don't know what to do. Now they feel like their salvation didn't really count, didn't matter, messed it up. They need to know this quickly. Amen. That if you confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So I say for a new Christian, read the book of 1 John first. Yeah. Yes. For the person who's not saved, read the book of John. That's the way I say it. And I don't really care what you read, just read something. I mean, if we get down to it, just read something. But if somebody asks you where to start, there you go. So if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. This is where you being able to, in a right relationship with God, a right relationship with God, being able to admit your fault. Being able to quickly admit when you've wronged God or man or violated your own conscience in some way. 
To quickly admit that is the way that you tap into being cleansed from all unrighteousness. Helps you stay clean by the blood of Jesus. Uh, and we've said that we're having to deal with this quite often because there's been preachers of, of late who have said and are saying that Christians don't need to confess their sins anymore. They're saying that this was written only for sinners, and I don't know how they get that. It's just trying to read the Bible with one eye open and prove some point that you want to prove that's not there. So don't fall for that. This is written to believers, and so admitting sins is what believers do. Okay? Sinners don't need to admit sins. Sinners need to admit that they're a sinner. And sinners need to confess Jesus Christ in order to be saved. That's what sinners need. Christians are the ones that need to admit sins. And here's how you need to understand it. The reason we do it is not so that we can remain saved. Amen. And this is where people have taken this one scripture and said, See, if you don't confess your sin, you're not forgiven. That means you go to hell. You can't do that with scripture. You need to put the puzzle together a lot better than that. And what you realize is that you are saved whether you sin or not. If, if you believe in Jesus and have received Him, you are saved whether you sin and realize it and admit it or not. Amen. So we are saved by faith alone. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by, we are made righteous by faith alone. I have right standing by my belief not by my deeds or lack thereof. Okay, so I don't have to confess sins to remain saved. And I don't have to confess sins so, so that God can say, now I forgive you. That's not why he's saying this. He's not saying God's going to hold back forgiveness and hold something against you until you admit it. Right. What he's saying is for your sake, you need to admit it or your heart's going to get all goofed up. Okay? God is merciful. And, and God, God wouldn't harbor unforgiveness. He doesn't want you to harbor unforgiveness. He wants you to forgive people whether they admit it or not. Doesn't He? So He's going to be at least that good. He's going to forgive you whether you admit it or not. This is for you. This is for us. And it's part of any right relationship. Admitting a fault or a wrong or a sin is part of any right relationship. Mm -hmm. With your spouse, it would be dishonest if you wouldn't admit when you were wrong. Mm -hmm. It'd be dishonest if you couldn't say, I'm sorry. It's dishonest. Mm -hmm. Parents to children. If you can't admit to your children sometimes that you were wrong and say, I'm sorry, it shows the child to be dishonest in their relationship. Same thing with God. Part of any right relationship is to be able to admit faults and, and, and keep, the, keep the openness in the relationship. Amen. Isn't that right? That's right? And so that's why God, we have a relationship with our Father. He wants us to keep it right. Mm -hmm. That's why ignoring what you've done wrong and just covering up, oh, no, He doesn't care. No, 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 no. Amen. Verse 10, again, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar. So John's here trying to help you admit that you've sinned and uh, not just hide it and run off from it. We make him a liar and his word's not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1, I'm just going to read this because it goes with verse 9. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice how he ties this. Well, it's, it's in the same context. He says, I write this so that you may not sin. So he doesn't want us to sin. So having been made righteous without works, having been made righteous by faith alone does not mean that we keep sinning. He actually wrote this so we wouldn't sin. So not sinning is important. You know, grace does not erase... Do's and don'ts. That's right. Grace does not erase God's will for our life. Right. You just do what you want. It's just all grace now. No, grace does not erase it. Grace still has within that uh, this inherent instruction and command to walk right and walk uprightly before God. Yes. So I wrote these, he, he wrote these things so that we don't sin. 
And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice this. It starts off, my little children. He's not talking to sinners. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to his children in the faith. Or we can say God's children in the faith. And so this is absolutely written for the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastor Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming, or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel.